This video is part of the Public Health to Data Science Rebrand Program. Okay, good evening everyone and welcome to our meetup today. Um, today's topic is, thank you for coming. Today's topic is managing from the bottom. So what managing from the bottom actually is, it sounds bad, but it's not bad. And I can guarantee that it's not bad because I'm a manager. What managing from the bottom is, is doing things in your job to make your manager's job easier. And probably you're already doing a lot of those things, but there's some maybe that you hadn't thought of. Or, um, and sometimes when I'm coaching people, like I tell them stuff and they're like, you're kidding. The manager's gonna like that. But I explain what it's like to be a manager and then they realize, oh yeah, they might actually like that. Um, so I, I just wanted this to be kind of like a panel discussion where we all sort of share um, uh, like tips and tricks. And what I was gonna do is just sort of write it down. Let me share my screen here. So I was just gonna write down like, um, like different strategies and you guys can say um, whatever you want. Uh, I, I have the first question I was gonna ask everybody. Um, do you have any strategies you use when you write to your manager in email to make it easy to get permission to do something? Um, and if so, what are they? And oh, and I preface this with most of the time people like us are doing really technical data intensive jobs and whoever we're reporting to or even when I'm working with customers, oftentimes they don't really understand exactly what I'm doing. So it becomes kind of difficult to like communicate. So the first question here, do you have any strategies you use when you write to your manager an email to make it easy to get permission to do something or just to clarify what you're doing and get approval? And if so, what are they? Can you think of any? Do you avoid writing to your manager an email? <laughs> Or do you like to write to your manager an email? I don't know, to be honest. So, well, what what do you normally say if you write to your manager? Like, we were talking about the manager you work with most of the time, and she's pretty nice. Mm -hmm. um, do you ever have to write to her to get um, permission, like even to take a day off or something like that? Oh, so those are the things that. So uh, I need to, I'd like to take PTO because blah, 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 that's it. Okay, well, do you do, do you use any strategies when you word that email to make it like easier on the manager? No. So well, there, <laughs> but I know short is better. Okay, so you try to make it short. You. Do you, if you're taking time off because you have a complicated family matter, do you explain the whole thing? No. So that's, so I don't even, the, if that's a family matter, I don't say that I have a time conflict or something like this. Okay, I, so 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 one thing is um, keep emails to managers short and just summarize personal matters, right? Yeah. Okay, well, when you're like asking for time off or anything like that, what do you think the manager needs to know in that email? What, is, what do you have to include? Well, so the quick reasoning and how many dates or how long. Okay, so, so you need to um, so be clear, clear about dates. If you uh -huh. are asking for a time, time off or date related things and times. Okay. And you said reason. Um, why, why would you have to give a reason exactly? Do you, do you know why? Um, I just customary do. <laughs> well, well, I'll tell you why. <laughs> because payroll, time off on payroll gets classified. Like there's vacation, sick time, 
part-time earned part time there's all these classifications of mm -hmm. time off and if you're like emailing me in the middle of the day and you're like i feel sick i'm going home i automatically can guess that you're taking sick time but if you email me and you say i have a personal matter i'm taking tomorrow off i don't know if you're taking vacation or part-time or you know what i mean so may so when you say reason that's what the manager really wants to know is how do i process your payroll for this time actually you know I mean? in my company so there so there is already uh, the time time of request web-based thing available and if that's mm -hmm. a planned pto mm -hmm. so that that just i select it and once that i submitted on that so they are online that's automatically go to that manager notify her or him or she's going to take a pto i see so you file that um form electronically mm -hmm. in, in like synchronized with emailing her and explaining right so there is i see so she already kind of knows but of course if you say i'm taking the <laughs> if you say i'm I'm taking um sick time for two weeks to go on vacation. That's not gonna work, right? Well, so it's you gotta... not. So there there is a sick day. So there there are all kinds of selections are already. I know available. that's what I was saying. And so part of part of what so I, I guess you're actually answering it totally right, Mika, is when you're emailing the manager, what she's kind of doing is looking at that data entry and making sure they match right mm -hmm. and let's say you even made a mistake because there's only a million choices right and i as a manager have made a mistake on those like weird ones like going to the funeral or whatever um then you can just she can just fix it if you made the mistake and so so that's good so it's um when taking time off the manager has to oh i'll to classify the time off Okay, that's very good. Um, Mika, this is actually very good. Um, Beth, you were gonna say something. Do you wanna say something? Is there something um, you try to include in email when um, emailing your supervisors or bosses? I think everything that um, Mika said, I, I, I agree, but I do have the hardest time. Like, I feel like sometimes I over communicate and, mm -hmm. um, or like, you know, organize about what to, um, like, you know, if I need to give all my personal reason for if I'm taking mm -hmm. some time off. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know, I think I over communicate. But, oh, um, okay, it's hard to choose what exactly to say, over communicate or under communicate. And I think I also heard what you said is that it's hard to organize um, the ideas in the email is is that like like the priority is that what you said yeah i think so um you know um we're, we were just taking about the simple case of trying to ask her time off um sometimes we actually have to ask something pretty complicated in email um just because we're forced to like there's no meeting available and we have to ask this um what one of the things i wanted to show you is this thing i learned and i even cannot find it on the internet i learned it a long time ago and it has really helped me choose how to communicate when i have a message regardless of whether it's for my boss or somebody equal or someone below me and that is this concept of so first of all, right now, what's happening is synchronous communication between us because we're having a meeting. So if we're ever talking on the phone or having a meeting, it's called synchronous. If we're like texting each other or we're emailing each other or leaving message on the discussion board, you can see that that's asynchronous, okay? Now, when we have a synchronous communication, Think of all of the emotion we can communicate. Just think of all the nuance. Like I can say something, you can interrupt me, we can make jokes, you know, something that wouldn't look the same in asynchronous, right? Like 
imagine I text you something and you're like, maybe that's a joke, but I don't think it's funny. I mean, it's hard to tell in asynchronous. So one of the things um, is the, this thing here, and I'll give you these links. This is this triangle, um, this rhetorical triangle of ethos, logos, and pathos. And the only reason I'm showing you this is because somebody taught me this communication thing. I don't remember who they are, but it's like really useful, okay? So logos communication are facts, statistics, case studies, scientific evidence. You guys don't know what that is, right? Just kidding. Um, but you know how we were just talking about, like if you're asking for a day off or you're asking, you need to do something, that's kind of logos. That's like what day, when, or how many hours, you know? And I'll tell you, logos stuff works really well in asynchronous. Like if I'm coming over to your place and I'm talking on the phone, I'll say, text me your address, right? Because that's logos is text is the address. I can put it in the GPS and I won't screw it up. But if you've ever been on an email chain, especially at work, where somebody's like, okay, here's when our meeting is, and that's a bunch of logos. And what you get back is a bunch of pathos, which is emotional stuff that says, how, how come we're having this meeting when you know I'm going to be gone? So that's a bunch of emotion. So what I've learned is if ever you're having asynchronous communication about logos and it turns pathos, stop the asynchronous communication. So if I'm texting you guys and saying, okay, let's meet up at the restaurant and somebody texts back and says, I hate that restaurant. Why are you picking on me? Well, then I'm going to call you. And that's sort of the way it would used to work. I'd be at the army and we'd be emailing and then somebody would be upset and I'd, I'd go call them because it just doesn't get better. If somebody starts getting upset an email or on the text gets a pathos there, it's not going to get any better. You're going to have to talk to them. And ethos, this in communication, like I haven't even mentioned it, this trustworthiness that that generally has to do with public speaking, like going up and being trustworthy. But I don't have a problem with that. I only have a problem with the logos and the um, pathos. All right. Well, that was just a little thing I wanted to give you guys. Um, all right. Well, we've talked a little about um, communicating asynchronously in email. Let's um, talk about this other communication that we might have with managers when they're stressed out. Because remember, we work in um, environments where there's data and we have access to the data and we understand it. But a lot of times our supervisor, either they understand it, I mean, they're smart enough to understand it, but they're just too busy to have their fingers in it. So they really rely on us to just communicate to them how their projects are doing. And you can feel really stressed out if you don't really understand what people are saying. So let's think of a time, try to think of a time, a time when a manager appeared mad or stressed about a project you were working on when nothing was actually wrong. The manager simply didn't understand and was stressed about it. Did anybody successfully explain it to them? And if so, what strategies worked the best for like calming them down or unconfusing them? And you might have to just think of a time when you observed this, you know, and might not have been you who were participating. Can, can you think of a time when your manager was stressed about something? Like, how did they act? Wow, you guys have awesome jobs. My managers are stressed all the time. Oh, so, yeah, that's the situation. Manager is stressed out because of that project I am working on or in general. Just where a manager is stressed out, like for instance, let's say that you're working on a project and you're gonna get it done in time. Like you're probably even gonna get it done ahead of time, but it's just not done yet. And so the manager's all stressed out because they're worried you won't get it done in time, even though you know you will. I mean, I've been in that situation a lot in my life because the manager just doesn't really understand what I'm doing. So they're like all freaked out. But mm -hmm. I always just tell them, don't worry about it. I'll get it done a day early. Like I'm almost done now. <laughs> Still freak out. <laughs> uh, in that case, so there, yeah, I just kind of give her usually. I okay. 
So there, I don't know if my manager is stressed out or not because we are all remote. I don't see her, I don't hear her, but uh, what I do usually do is I just have, I just give her sort of like a status report, just a quick status report. Mm -hmm. what I am doing, uh, where it is, and uh, just a and, casual. And, and you do that by email? Uh, sometimes email, but most of the time, I just kind of drop chat. That's all. Oh, I see. You have a chat thing yeah. at work. Okay. So you can do um, short status reports, keep managers apprised. How how does she respond when you give her a status report? Does she say thank you or does she start talking to you or? Uh, so the um, usually not uh, no response, but if she started talking about something, that's a bad news usually because uh, usually those are the time she wants me to hurry up or she, the priority switched to something else and I have to switch to different project. Usually that kind of thing. If she doesn't respond, no news is a good news, that's it. So it sounds to me like um, she is, so usually when I'm a manager, you know, I don't just wait around for people to give me progress reports, <laughs> you know, I mean, that's pretty passive, you know what I'm saying? Um, but I guess that's her style. It's not a bad idea to give people progress reports, but you you identified the problem with it, Mika, is if you're kind of a like a passive manager, you're not active, you're not like on top of things, like trying to get ahead of stuff. What happens is if someone talks to you, emails you, you go, oh, I got to do something. And you just start talking to them randomly about whatever you want to talk about. You know what I mean? Like, um, for example, imagine I emailed you guys and I said, look, I published a new course for you guys. And here I gave you a new video. And you guys just didn't respond. Like, what does that mean? You don't even care? You know what I mean? And so um, there, so what one of the problems can so so because you're you're uh communicating asynchronously i mean whatever your system works right but because you're communicating asynchronously it's hard to learn emotions right like i mean it sounds fine but like let's say just imagine you called your boss every day and said here's what i'm doing you could hear emotions like you would learn a lot more emotionally about what's going on but maybe it's better that you don't. Um, one of the things is sometimes you're sort of trapped interacting with a manager who is in a stressed state. Um, and sometimes my um, employees have been <laughs> trapped with me in a stressed state, which is probably not good. And I actually, I once had an employee who was being abused at work by unfortunately my boss. And one day a really bad thing happened and she started screaming at me because she was so over the top. I mean, she wasn't really mad at me, but she just started screaming at me. So it's really hard to deal with sometimes when you have that kind of emotion. But I wanted to share something with you that, um, that I, I, I learned along the way and I found it really useful, but it's a skill and you have to practice it, okay? You can't just like, you know, like this thing I just showed you, Logos Path, like you can apply that right away. This is something you have to practice and it's not that easy. And, but you can practice with anybody. It's a way of interacting with people and it's called active listening. Have, if either of you have heard about it, just, you know, let me know that you've heard about it. I want to hear about it from you. To be honest, I don't even know where I learned about active listening. I could have learned about it in like a psychology class or a communication class or a management class. Like, I don't even remember, but I've learned that it's taught. Like you see here, this is by a social worker. It's taught in therapy. It's like to help people communicate better. Um, but I really use it in management a lot. 
So what active listening is, is it's the set of skills or techniques for interacting, talking, but it's not a set of skills I would use just in day-to-day -day conversation. It's a set of skills I use when the conversations get heated, like when that employee was screaming at me because she had just been verbally attacked by someone else. And so one, one of the ways, so you can see these are the choices. So first, be fully present. So she came into my office and she was saying, she was screaming. She was saying, I had it with this place. Everybody's bullying me, you know. And one of the things I did was I, um, I repeated back to her. I reflected what I heard. Like I said, um, you know, and I also gave her compassion. I said, I'm sorry you're going through this. You can give people compassion without validating what happened. Like if somebody says, somebody stole my car, like you may not know whether they stole the car, but you can say, I'm sorry you're going through this. And I also said to her, um, I, I, I hear you've been attacked again by my boss or you've been insulted again, and it's not fair to be insulted. You know, saying statements that are factual and supportive are helpful. Um, when people are not so heated like she was there, like sometimes people have come to me and said, I think you're treating me unfairly. And I'll say, okay, well, well tell me about that. How, how do you think I'm treating you unfairly? Or in what way do you think I'm treating you unfairly? And then I try to listen to what they're saying but when you're active listening, you really listen to what they're saying, not for the purpose of figuring out what you're going to say, but to just make sure that you can kind of repeat back to them what they just said so you understand it. And so like these questions here, can you tell me more about that? Or like I always say like, well, how did that make you feel? Or why did you choose to do that? And you, I'm really open minded. And usually um what I found is when I've been in really horrible situations, like I'm presenting on a database and some random person starts yelling at me, which is shocking, but happens. I, I would start doing this. I'd start listening to them yell and I'd hear what they were yelling. And I'd say, okay, I hear you're saying this and that, you know, you seem upset. Why are you so upset? It, you know what I mean? It would really take the temperature down. I mean, I'm glad you guys don't have all of that. But I'll, I'll give you this link to this active listening. And what's nice about it is it feels weird, but if you start doing it with people who are feeling emotional, like if somebody's, you know, somebody you love came home from work and they're like, I had a really bad day, just practice this active listening and they'll feel really good. They'll feel really heard by you. Like they'll feel like, wow, this was a great conversation. So it's not a bad set of skills. Already, any questions so far? No, just going to say it is one of the areas, even uh, for parenting, that where oh. I try, <laughs> where I work. That's a good one. Well, I continue to work on. I mean, it's definitely. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting yeah. you brought that up. I I don't have any kids, but there was a, a few different periods of my life where, for whatever reason, I was taking care of a lot of like teenage boys, not teenage girls, teenage boys. And I'd already learned all these sort of management skills and, and stuff. And I do a lot of yoga. I realized that a lot of the stuff does come naturally to me because I've been like practicing it so much. And it, it really, it really does like teenagers can really be like very um, emotional, like very hair trigger emotional. It's just teenage years. And they it's weird because they act sort of adult when they're being emotional but they like i can't even tell you how many times one of them being emotional and i'd just be like are, are you are you feeling okay <laughs> you know? and they'd be like no in fact this brings up a good other thing i wanted to show you which is you're gonna laugh at how simple this is but it works so well for me and actually i learned it from like I, I'm not in recovery, but I learned a lot about Alcoholics Anonymous and I learned it from that. And it's the HALT technique. So if you ever feel like, if you've ever feel like you're in a mood where you're just snapping at people or you're just, anything is sort of pushing you over the edge or you're working with someone 
you know, either your kid or your friend or somebody at work, and you feel like they're feeling like that, especially if it's somebody you know pretty well, right? Try this HALT principle. So HALT, you know, means stop, right? But you just stop and then you look at this. So here's what HALT stands for. Hungry, angry, lonely, and tired. And I'll tell you, when I'm in a bad mood, like a really bad mood, like, and I don't know why, you know, it's not caused by anything. I really do sit and ask myself this. Like I have blood pressure problems. So sometimes it is hungry. Um, sometimes I'm feeling angry about something and I didn't really realize it. So I look at that. Lonely is a little hard. You know, if you're feeling lonely, you're feeling lonely. But at least you can know it and you can try to seek out something to make you feel less lonely. Like, you know, if you're just feeling sad about something that happened, you can look for something that'll make you, you know, put you in a better mood. Um, and feeling tired, that's that's one if you can identify it. If you can take a short nap, it really, really, really helps. Like even if you're exhausted because you're working on a project, if you can find a way to take even less a half hour nap and wake up again, it really will help your mood. But anyway, that's the halt principles. And when I would use that with those, like, Sometimes these teenagers would be screaming and I'd just stop and I'd say, let me just ask you, are you feeling hungry? Are you feeling angry and <laughs> lonely? And you, I was surprised. Sometimes they'd be screaming. I'd say, are you hungry? And then they'd just say, yeah. And we'd eat and everything was over. So <laughs> it's kind of funny. Um, but anyway, so you're learning all my management tricks. All right, let's look at... Um, let me see. Here is one that I wanted to share with you because I think this might have probably has happened to all three of us at one point. And here it is. Think of a time you were given an assignment to do with data, but you could not do it because of a problem with the data that was not caused by you. How did you explain the problem to whoever gave you the data? And what did you two do to resolve the problem? Like in my previous roles, I most of the tasks that I have to do were very limited in the way, and I know what I need to do and what I need to get. And so I didn't have a lot of responsibilities. And but at the same time, like the managers, at least the last one or two, were really nice, very approachable. Like, you know, just you could just use Teams or whatever question you have, they were like, you know, there's no you know, stupid questions. So come to me, whatever if you have. So, and then they happened to be mostly women too, and they were and moms. And so they were like, really motherly. Nice. <laughs> yeah. They were like, oh, sweetie, we'll fix it. But yeah. were, were there, even, even though they were nice and motherly and stuff, did you ever have to come to them and say, well, you assigned me to do this, but the data aren't really like that. And you had to explain to them that whatever they told you to do, it just can't really happen that way. Yes, I mean, a slightly different case, like where I done some of the, um, I just did some uh, correlation analysis that was done. And then um, my manager had to give a presentation. She wanted to include some of my, um, some of the work that I've, I've done and I presented to her and liked it, but then she had like, a, but she wanted to include it in her upcoming uh, presentation, but then she didn't quite understand or like didn't know the right terms in which to present oh, it. She had trouble and, presenting the statistics because she's not a statistician, huh? Right. So she was a little bit stressed about it, but she so and then I felt um, because it was I was still in the process and it wasn't co completed. It's a work progress. And so progress, you didn't even so, feel very comfortable with the results yet. Like you weren't like feeling like, okay, this is the official results yet. <laughs> right. Or I haven't like written a proper report to, to provide. So I've just given her what I have and she wanted to include it. And so like the, the morning before she was very stressed about it. And so I was just trying to find ways and, you know, to just like, you know, uh, make her feel less stressed and just um you know I just wrote a little summary of what the test is and mm -hmm. um 
Did you write it in such a way that she could just kind of read it like this and say, this is a correlation. It's a Pearson with a P value. Yeah, so I did, a, I did, a, I did a <laughs> short paragraph about that and, and that helped. And she was grateful that for that. And she also apologized that like, you know, that she stressed me out, but like I, so, I mean, it was very uh, uh, stressed that leading out to produce something it wasn't quite ready and I explained but she also was like this isn't like this is a very like preliminary report so it didn't really and she was presenting as such and so yeah um, and you know I think you did a really good job so so first of all um let me just validate that it's really hard if you're a non-statistician to present statistics like that aren't super obvious like it means you know what I mean like correlations a little difficult for non-statisticians and unfortunately Beth you're kind of in this role where you're like okay am I supposed to be the statistics professor like I don't even know how to teach statistics and now I suddenly have to give a lesson so I think you did a really wonderful job that you um I'm sorry I've got this new kitty here running around I, I think you did a really smart thing where you wrote that paragraph to help her um, and it was good that you sat down and tried to explain it to her. Um, and I am happy that she apologized to you for being stressed. Um, but you can kind of understand if you're somebody who doesn't get statistics and you're presenting them and you're afraid somebody's going to ask you a question, just how nerve wracking that is. One thing I learned from being in that position because I was in this position a lot with a friend of mine who was a surgeon and he didn't understand statistics is one thing I learned that I told him is that if people ask you, if, if you're presenting and you're not Beth, you're not the statistician, you're the project lead or whatever. And somebody in the, in the audience asks that person who's not a statistician to go deeply into the stats it's totally cool for the PI to say, oh, you know, I'm not the statistician. Here's her email. Just contact her and you can talk to her. And you can tell all your PIs that when you do stuff. And that's what I do now is I let them know, like if they don't know, I just say, in case you didn't know, if you get like, I'll teach you how to present this. But if they start getting in the weeds, just tell them, I'm sorry, I'm not the statistician. Monica's a statistician. She'll talk to you directly. And that's just a way of getting out from under those questions, because that's one of the things that scares them the most. All right. So that's one thing I learned. Another thing I do is I, when I would tell Steve, he's a sur sur surgeon, when he was going to present some stats and I wasn't going to be there, I tried to be there, like just to be supportive if you can. It, like if they're presenting at a meeting and the meeting's like internal, like it's on Zoom or something, and you can just sit there and just be there for support, just do that. Like if they want you to, if they're cool with it, you know, just do that. I, I always would do that. Just And, and then they can call on you and you can talk about it um, and they feel super supported. But when Steve would go alone and he'd go present, I just remind him, you know, Steve, nobody understands this stuff. Like I understand it, but there's probably nobody in the audience you could probably say it totally wrong and they wouldn't even know so so go ahead and tell them that too all right but yeah Mika have you ever had a problem like that where you made like some huge regression equation or something like that and you had to prep someone to understand it it was a non-statistician not to really not to because I haven't to dance regression but because uh well, so the, in the industry setting, we even hardly run regression. Mm -hmm. Always mean percent. If there is a standard deviation, it's already scares people off. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it is, it is. So you're, you're counting people at work? <laughs> uh, well, so they are, it's always like this. So they are, that's why. So they, I don't even use those things. Even behind the scene, I am using it. And so they are all, all things I present. It's a percent, mean, frequency. So you, you sneak around and do logistic regression when they're not looking. Yeah, so, so they, the, that's what I presented. 
And then, so people yeah. are happy about it. So <laughs> those are the things majority of the people understand it, comfortable mm -hmm. about it. They can deal with the Excel, great. So, <laughs> but but I mean, are you ever assigned to do something complicated that nobody can understand and then somehow deliver or not? Uh, so the uh, not the statistical analysis though. Mm -hmm. Just the, other the thing it is always difficult. But uh, at my end, it's why it did it take so much time to clean data? That, oh, that's so how, how do you the so how do you answer the question of why does it take so much time to clean the mm -hmm. data? You know, Steve did that to me once, Mika. Um, Steve, the surgeon I was talking about, he did this um, survey with his surgeon friends. I'm sorry, this everything's knocked over. And he, it was a Likert scale survey and it had like 50 questions. And he did this thing where he sat down and he said, Monica, you know, clean this data and analyze the survey. And I said, Steve, I don't have time. And it happened to be a day when he was coming to my building because there was an event at my building where he was working. So I said, Steve, come to this event and then we'll leave the event and go up to my office and I'll show you why it's going to take me so long. So I brought up the Excel and in the Likert um, scale, he had not always written like one through five. Like on one of them, he put like 2.5. On one of them, he put like, it was like empty. And I, I went through every single one with him. And I was like, see how I, I, like we sat there for like an hour and we cleaned the data by hand. Like there was maybe a hundred surveys. And I'm like, see, Steve, this is the kind of stuff you do to me. Like, I'm going to have to, I, I, he just laughed. I remember he was laughing so hard. He goes, okay, I'll never ask you that question again. And he literally did never ask me that again. When I said it was taking a long time for data prep for our other things, he literally like, <laughs> that that ended it. But that that's kind of funny. But the real answer is, when people are asking what is taking so long about like data prep or like ETL, one answer is to actually educate them. And one way to do that is with like a lot of things you probably learn in this program, which is where you document visually what you're doing. And if you document visually what you're doing, you do two things. One is you help people gain an appreciation for how complicated what you're doing is. Secondly, you make them feel very like this certain kind of misery. It's this misery of like where they're sort of bored, but they're also feel like there's this tedium and they also feel like this fear, like you'll go away and they'll have to do your job. So it's like this feeling after a while, like at first they're like, oh, I see what's going on. And then it's this feeling like, please don't tell me anymore. I understand this is awful and I'll give you another week. You know, like that's usually what I can get out of these people because, you know, I would run a data warehouse and they'd bring some data to me and they'd say, put it in the warehouse today. So I have to build an ETL routine and I've never seen the data before. And I'd be like, oh, you expect this tonight? <laughs> like what do you, you want to analyze this data and get something out of it? You don't even know what's in it. You know what I mean? And so that that's. I used to just deal with the fact that people were saying, where's the database? Where's the database? Where's the analysis? Where's the analysis? And I never really knew how to solve that. And that's when I started making all this documentation and showing them examples. And, you know, because nobody could log into SAS. Like, literally, nobody's going to see what I'm seeing. So I started making, like, diagrams and showing them snippets of examples of data. You know, just going to meetings and presenting all that all the time. And what ended up happening is people started being like having go, you know doing less meetings with me because you know they just they were just like just don't waste your time in the meeting just hurry up and get all that work done so we can get our data like that's ended up what happened and it was also nice because i had all this diagrams i had everything documented and so when people were saying well what have you been doing for the last three months i, I had an answer you know but um, but yeah, that's a difficult one when you're building a database or you're preparing an analytic data set or you're trying to do a bunch of reports or 
Um, and everybody's asking, like, what's taking so long for data prep? That's kind of a big one. Let me see if I've got, oh, here's here's a good one. I wanted to show you this. Um, I, I don't like to read books a lot. <laughs> I don't, the peer reviewed literature has ruined me, but I, I can't believe that I'm recommending a book by two guys, but this book is really good. It's not a very long book. Like if you buy this book, it's called Getting to Yes. And it's not a very long book. And it's about negotiation, but I'll be honest with you, it really changed how I interact with people. Like, especially in the workplace, because one of the main lessons in the book is that people don't really have something that they're trying to get specifically, but they have more interests. Like if you're negotiating, like if I'm selling my car and you're trying to buy it, you know, I have different interests than maybe the next person selling their car. Like maybe my interest, like I remember when I was moving to Boston, my interest in selling my car was to hurry up and sell it. I didn't really care how much money I got because I was in a hurry. Um, a different person selling a car might be have their interest be that they get more money. And so interest, when you negotiate on the basis of interest is where you basically figure out what each side actually wants, what they, they their priorities in the negotiation. And then it's a lot easier to sort of come up with the terms. And I found that in like negotiating like data use agreements or data transfers, because sometimes like my people would want some data and the place, you know, giving out the data, I'd be like, well, what are you worried about? Well, they were always worried about different things. Like we're worried about our data being hacked or we're worried about you. We're not worried about it being hacked. We're worried about you analyzing it and not understanding it properly. You know, they would have different interest and that would help me in my negotiation because I'd be like, okay, well, why don't we analyze it and show it to you? Why don't we write that into our agreement? And then that way you can approve it. So I really strongly um, recommend that you um, just read this book, uh, like when you have a chance. And I think that it'll affect you in such, it's such a simple book that it, you'll just think differently about negotiations. You'll probably do like a better job. And especially like Beth mentioned kids. Um, it, it actually is kind of good because you can teach kids about like th to think this way when they're negotiating with you. And then it's a little easier to get along with them. Like smart ones will learn that this is a good way to get their way. <laughs> All right. Um, so let me see here. So that was a good discussion. Um, let me see if I've got another, um, So I'm going to just throw a, a scenario out there because I think we all experienced a scenario like this at least once, okay? Imagine there's a manager you dislike meeting with in person because he acts intimidating. He doesn't look you in the eye and often puts down what you say. What are strategies, what strategies do you recommend to make meetings like this go easier? I don't know, like, you know, prep beforehand or like, you know, jot down the I, the main ideas that you need to discuss with that person or with, that, with your manager. That sounds very... Um, um, let's see here. Plan what you are going yeah. to say in a meeting. Jot down ideas. Well, it's always kind of a good idea. Like, even when I was, I've been close to my manager, I've always had, a, like, I would have a post-it note of the mm -hmm. things I want to talk to him, I'd run. He'd call it a drive by. <laughs> I'd be doing a drive by and asking him about five things and leaving. But yeah, it's not bad to be prepared. And you're right. If you feel confident in what you're going to say, it makes it better. Um, one of the things that um, I I had a really bad thing happen to me once where. I was meeting alone with two guys. One of them I'd met before and he was just a really nice guy, but the other one started acting up. And so I, at the point when he started acting up, I was sitting down and the other nice guy was sitting down and the apparently acting up guy was standing up and he was writing on the, the whiteboard. I don't know. We were just discussing something. And I asked him a question, like a totally innocent question about what he was writing. And I, he just snapped. He like got in my face and he was using this um, marker and he was saying, you, 
your problem is you don't know anything about you, you, you. And he was like in my face, right? And I'm like sitting down. And this is, we were alone at MIT on a Saturday. Like it was bad. So here's what I did. I'll tell you what I did to solve this is I used I statements. So here is what I did, which is kind of hilarious, but I was so scared. So, I mean, the guy wasn't that big, but he was kind of like looking cuckoo. Okay. And so he came to me and he's going, you, you, you. And what I did was I put up my hand and I said, can we use I statements? And he's kept saying, you are. And I said, please, can we please use I statements? I can't understand what you're saying when you say you, you, you. That's what I said. And the reason I said that is because it's true. If somebody's saying, you know, you're always late, you're not, your ideas are not that good, you, 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 you feel attacked. And I realize that, that even if people come to me and say, you're the only reason I'm working here or whatever, you know, like I, I, I would feel kind of attacked. And so I started trying to find a way to not make you statements and instead make I statements. And it's actually not that easy. You have to practice it. But I found that when I make I statements, it, everything comes off better. Like, rather than saying to like a customer, you're not making any progress. I can say, I'm worried that you're not making the progress I was expecting. You know, that way I'm, I'm owning it. I'm owning that whoever isn't making progress. It's not like I'm accusing them. And so the, these, um, these the, there's this five-step formula you know, for an I statement. And I statements are like really good if you're trying to communicate to somebody that they're doing something problematic to you. Like, like, um, like I was talking to someone today and I just said to them, I said, you know, whenever I, t I meet with you, I observe that you seem really desperate and I observe you seem really stressed out. And um, I feel like I want to do something to help that and not, exacerbate it. You know what I'm saying? And so notice how if I had said, you know, whenever I see you, you look really stressed out and overwhelmed. And, you know, do you, is there something you want me to do about it? You know, like that sounds sort of like a tacky, whereas the way I said it, it's a little um, easier. And so um, sometimes when you're with these tough guys, you know, they're very intimidating. They're like, I don't know. Uh, your ideas are not that important. You're not, you know, the one in charge, blah, blah, blah. You know, they do that. Part of the reason they're doing that is they feel intimidated by you, which is weird. Like, I know it's hard to believe. Like, I always be like, I'm so small and short and, and uh, ineffectual, but somehow they're intimidated by me. So I just remember that they're intimidated by me. So if I just say, I, oh, I'm sorry if I didn't, you know, explain this well enough, or if you're confused, it's probably my fault, or I can reword this, or I can put it this way, or I can sit and listen to what you have to say. You know, I, 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 I makes people feel less, more at ease, you know, than you, you, you. So, I, and I didn't really think about that, but then I changed how I did things and it made it easier. All right. Well, um, and, we're coming to the end of our hour. Is there anything, um, any last sort of advice or any last sort of comments anybody wants to make? I think you guys have um, figured out ways of working in the workplace around all of your data complexity um, without, you know, just by being excellent, by just doing your job really well, you don't really have to communicate much, right? Oh, all right. Well, what I'll do is I'll save um, this in our folder and I'll also add the links to the bottom of this that I was showing you. I, I had a few more, but I'll put, I'll put the, all the links there and you can take a look at them um, if you want. All right. And so uh, thank you for showing up tonight. Thank you for watching this video, which is part of the Public Health to Data Science rebrand program. If you are interested in joining the program, please sign up for a 30 minute Zoom interview using the link in the description.